collapses completely. And this is what causes the cessation of breathing. Now, you can imagine what that does <clears throat> to the rest of your um, major organs. Your brain goes into a total panic. Your heart starts to beat faster. You're at a high risk of stroke because snorers traditionally get a thickening of the carotid artery. So all of a sudden, you're getting a sudden rush of blood to your head. If there's any weakness in that artery, you're going to get a stroke straight away. So there's so many other things. There's a big pressure on the kidneys. There's also uh, pressure on various other areas, such as hypertension as well. Um, it's, it's not sleep apnea is unlikely to kill you. It's what it does that will kill you, and it certainly will. Uh, we're looking at, if we take the cost of one road traffic accident, which has been costed out by government agents at 1.5 million, if we save one person from falling asleep and having a crash, they say 20% of road traffic accidents are caused by sleepy drivers. There are three categories of sleepy drivers. One is an untreated sleep disorder, two is young, aggressive male drivers, and the other is professional drivers trying to hit deadlines. If you even cut that in three and save one, you could put one and a half million into this programme. That would more than fund it. It's not big bucks. Do you know, it's about getting the right people together, put the strategy together. You know, the things that, there are methods of funding these things, but we have to have a strategy. There has to be a national strategy. That's all it is. It's not about money. It's about putting the brains together and getting it together. And it's the same for all the lung health. It's about putting a simple strategy together. That's all it is. Thank you. Um, Dr. Elisabeth. Thanks very much. Um, um, in answer to a question by Deputy Corrivi about uh, the uh, incidence of asthma in Ireland and the way we rank the fourth in terms of the Asthma World League, um, the answer to this question is we really don't know why is asthma is on an increase. Is it an artifact of better recognition that we know more about, about asthma and how to diagnose it? Asthma is unique in that it's an interplay between genetics and environment. So if you like, the genetics would load the gun and the environment would pull the trigger. That's a simple way of putting it. But there are so many other factors and attributes. Obesity, for example, can, is associated with increased asthma attacks. Uh, sorry, you, sorry, but is the, rate, is the rate of prevalence increasing rather than reducing over the last 20, 30, 40 years? Over the last 20, 30 years, it is increasing. Increasing? Yes. And that's, as I said, probably because... we don't fully understand why. We don't fully understand that. There's a lot of interactions around us, chemicals around us, you know, different, the environment that we're living in, air, quality of air, pollution, all this housing condition. Deputy Byrne mentioned yeah. something about mold in that. I mean, I, I'm a pediatrician. I sit in my clinic every day writing letters to city councils to, to, to try and remedy a situation where there's mold in the walls and the bedrooms and window sills and so on. So have, all this... Have you, have you spoken with local authority bodies or the structure in charge? Because if, if what Deputy Byrne is saying is the same that many of us are experiencing that more and more people are coming to us with respiratory or chronic lung issues, surely there's a recognition to be made by local authorities regarding the prevalence of asthma if it's, if it's increasing the level you're saying it is? Well, absolutely. I mean, all what I can do is obviously, as a clinical person, is to write a letter saying that this will definitely impact negatively on the welfare of this child. It will lead to exacerbation of asthma attack, hospital admission, you know, time of school, parents' time of work, all that. So, but the, you know, obviously, as you said, they will look at it and they will write back saying, well, they don't write back. The parents will come back and say, well, you know, that letter you wrote, nothing happened. And then could you write another letter? And then we have to, you know, all this happens every day in clinical practice as I see it. You've asked the question, uh, David Corrivi, about the, um, the one in 10 and one in five. So the incidence that we have in adults is one in 10, and one in five children in Ireland would suffer from asthma. Um, this is a little bit of a, a difficult area for us as, as, a, as a doctor who practice in, in pediatric medicine because there are a lot of other conditions, in, at least in the first five years of life, which can confuse the diagnosis of asthma. There are a lot of viral infections can result in symptoms similar to asthma. And in many occasions, we treat them with asthma medication. And that leads to, as they grow older, we heard the common famous saying that, you know, he had asthma, but he's outgrown it. Or she had asthma, but she's outgrown it. So yes, one in five, but there is a little bit of a gray area. If I were to, from clinical practice, it'd be probably one in seven, one in eight. And this would be one in 10 later on in life. Um, Professor Crown, you've asked a question about the guidelines. Indeed, um, in the Asthma Society, we've developed the e-learning 
uh, program in collaboration with the ICGP, Irish College of General Practitioners. And um, okay, while the uptake isn't great, but we try to make sure that they, they we send, we're standardizing the care of asthma uh, in Ireland. Uh, but yes, we need to do more work to make sure that this is filtering all the way down, that the care, the mm -hmm. primary care or secondary tertiary care is standardized according to the guidelines. Um, David Doherty, you asked about a very important point of the, of the in, in, inequality or inequity in treatment. We have no reason as to why. There, this medicine, which is called Zolair, just to put it simply, is like, is like a key in a lock. So the key fits in the lock within the cell, excites a reaction, releases a lot of substance that can cause asthma symptoms. The difficulty in breathing and wheeze and shortness of breath. This medicine targets the key, if you like. So it stops the key going into the lock. It, it's not suitable for everybody with asthma. It's definitely suitable for what we call the severe allergic asthmatics. And in Ireland, according to figures, we have uh, that 450 people qualify for the use of this medicine. This medicine is, is, a, is, is an injection that's taken on the skin, has to be taken every two to three weeks. And uh, there has been significant improvement in a study uh, performed by uh, Professor Lane and Professor Costello, which have shown significant reduction in exacerbation improvement in quality of life. Why is this an inequality? We really don't know. But what we know is that it's not covered by any of the schemes, the HSC, LTI, you know, high, uh, um, high tech uh, programs. So it's not covered by that. And as we speak, uh, one of our adult colleagues in Cork was 40 patients who cannot secure uh, funding to start them on treatment, 40 eligible patients that are not, uh, they cannot secure funding for them. Um, Finally, I've just finished, and I tell you, asthma, it is a simple condition if managed properly. And I'll just quote a, 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 one of the saying from one of the parents that wrote uh, about she lost tragically her daughter, and she said, I wouldn't have thought that my Tricia would die of an asthma attack in a million years. I'm paying a very high price for something I didn't know, and I'm living without Tricia, and that's just a nightmare. So education is key, education among you know, all the, uh, the sectors of the society, but particularly education is among the patients themselves. And that brings us to the National Asthma Program, which we would urge really to be expedited because this is the thing that's going to bring, bring it back to the level of the patient and the primary care. Education, properly resourced program where we have nurses, uh, asthma nurses because it's been shown time and time again that the role of asthma nurses in management of asthma, particularly in the area of pediatrics and even in adult uh, asthma, is, is huge. And, and the issue regarding the Zora medication that, that Ms. Cosby have mentioned, in terms, of, in terms of that, in terms of the, the cost of that, have we estimated the cost to the state of that? Uh, do we have a figure? Yeah, it's, it's 14,000 per patient per, per year, and there's about, we estimate about 250 who, who aren't accessing it. So the, I think it's about three and a half million if my, if my calculations are and right. And in the context of any further progression in that, has there only been any further correspondence or liaison with the well, HSC or with the department? The, the, the National Asthma Programme yes. and the Department of Pharmacoeconomics are actually, uh, you know, they are actually conversing and there's been two and four emails and so on. And uh, Dr. McCorn, I think, are you involved in any of these discussions with the National Asthma Programme? Uh, well, we're discussing, we're meeting actually with Michael Barry from the uh, National Centre for Pharmacoeconomics early, I think in the next couple of months for really, you to discuss it. I know that there's, with his, uh, the, that uh, Pat Manning, who's leading the National Asthma Programme, has scheduled a meeting for us, which the ITS and the Asthma Society, I'm sure, will be, will be involved in. Okay. Um, does that mean when you talk about there are people who are currently receiving the drug, they're obviously paying for it privately and receiving it through their own medical insurance or their own purse? Those who are not, it's because of the state. I'm confused. Can you explain yes. that to me? Sorry. Well, there are. There are certain institutions which are providing and you know providing funding for for, for patients to receive. Well, uh, for example, uh, the Dublin, some of the Dublin hospitals would have uh, provision for that. So okay, but now I'm just sorry to be pedantic. That means that the department has actually sanctioned it and has obviously cleared the finance for it to be delivered through the medical system. For certain hospitals. You can't. You can't. Are those country. patients? Sorry, are those patients public or private patients? It doesn't uh, matter. No, no, it shouldn't matter. You're right. But I, I want to just get a picture. Yeah. Well, well, Matthew, you're correct. I, I mean, it's a mixture of both. Okay. Public okay. and private. Sorry, is this? I'm, excuse my ignorance. Is this an oral medication? No, it's a subcutaneous injection. Well, I'm sorry not to be rude. 
You can't, when you're sanctioning the Department of Finances for a drug and you say, Bob's your uncle, you can have it, you can't say you can only have it in three hospitals and not in the other 32. Absolutely. It's, it's, it, 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 becomes a, it becomes a local decision for the, pharma, for, the, for, the, for the hospital itself and its own pharmacy budget. So in Cork, you've got the Mercy Hospital that's sanctioning it, saying we can afford it under our budget. And you've got CUH saying it's too expensive, it's 14,000 a year per patient. So you've got this inequity because it isn't covered under the, any of the reimbursement schemes and the hospital can't get a reimbursement for the cost of that. So it becomes a local decision. I'm sorry, uh, again, please forgive my ignorance. Is this subcutaneous injection one that people take while they're outpatients? Well, they come in have it as an outpatient be monitored because there's risk of anaphylaxis. So they'd be monitored for a couple of hours and then they go home. So, so, just after the first dose or on a repetitive basis? Repetitive basis. Every time. Every, time, every, time you every take, three, you take four weeks in the hospital. In the hospital. Okay. If there's a patient in Cork in a hospital that couldn't and doesn't have access to it, could you refer me to Beaumont that does? I'll no. refer to the other, in the case of Cork, if the Mercy Hospital, which you, says, which you said, is administering it, can I then be referred three miles up the road to the CUH? It isn't working that way in practice. Okay. It, it seems to. It shows that it decreases the frequency of admission to hospital with complications. Oh, absolutely. Okay. By about 67%. The, the problem with the National Centre for Pharmacoeconomics is they take, I believe, uh, not the most nuanced view of the totality of the healthcare costs associated with the new product. They look at the randomised trial, which is compared to the other one, and work out how much does it cost, and, you know, sticky quality on it. But basically, the case you need to make them, obviously, is that this can decrease resource utilisation, and that case may need to be made to somebody other than the NCPE. Professor McDonald? Mr. I have six patients currently on that Solar drug, and I had, I had more, and we've been able to stop the patients because they've responded to treatment. Um, I'm not allowed to put any more on, on the drug. Uh, the, the hospital is, tr is actively trying to stop me using it anymore, not in a nasty way, but basically they're very much aware of how much and it costs. Of cost and cost. And uh, I've recently been referred a patient who's relocated, relocated uh, to the Wicklow, Dublin area from Galway, who's getting it in Galway. And uh, I'm faced now with the issue that I can't start that patient on the drug in, in my practice up in Dublin. And for the moment, I've said, well, listen, we'll just have to go back to Galway every two weeks to get it, and uh, we'll see how this works. It's crazy, it's right? Absolutely crazy. Okay, do you want to come back to your questions? Uh, there's a, a few questions that may, may fall into my area. First, uh, Dr. Colreevy, uh, just the issue of the social deprivation and the link to respiratory diseases is a general one. It's particularly acute in COPD because uh, cofactors with smoking and past history of smoking clearly relate to deprivation, but also the issue of sort of early intervention makes a difference in these diseases, and people from the low, lower socioeconomic groups have poor access to health care. We know that. Uh, also, the other side of the coin is that uh, as you go through life and you've got COPD, you start to fall down the economic ladder by basically getting winter infections, which means that you can't turn up for work, you get passed over for promotion. If you're getting promotion, you lose your job, whatever, you go, have to go on disability. So it has a social impact as well as social factors promoting it. So that, that's just to sort of put a, put a line on that. Uh, the uh, Deputy Doherty asked me about nihilism, and I may have come across that perhaps I was nihilistic about it. I, I think there's a huge positive message coming out at the moment about COPD. Uh, Mr. McLean, who's uh, with me here today, has been on auction for six years, and despite that, he's still the, the person who's going to take on the running of the COPD support group when we get going for it. But there is an issue. Why have we been so slow to get a COPD support group going? And if this has been an international thing. It's, it's not just an Irish factor, but there are very few good COPD sports groups in, in, in other countries. In Britain, the British Lung Foundation, which is an umbrella organisation, looks after COPD. There is a separate COPD support group in the United States, but it has been a problem. And the factors that go into it are, again, the fact that a lot of the patients are socioeconomically deprived. A lot of them, by the time that they, they're aware of the problem, want to do something that's significantly disabled. Uh, these are all issues that, that, that feed into it. And there is sort of a, a little bit of embarrassment I, I, I've, I've known uh, politicians to have the disease who uh, when you start going up and saying would you like to be involved in a support organization as well you know so uh, we, we, you know there is a, there is a problem there but there is, but I think there's a huge positive message the drugs have improved there are improvements coming along the line but the COPD tends to be at the bottom of the queue and we're dealing with real numbers in terms of getting the program up here we can sort of say we have a hundred thousand patients yes we, we're fairly confident there's two hundred thousand that are not getting diagnosed and this comes to, to Deputy McClellan's point about making the diagnosis 
in the issue that we know spirometry is available in some general practices. It's a relatively simple test, but it does require training, and it's the training goes to practice nurses who get polled to look after all the other issues. And so we have this course running at the moment where we're training people. It's it's a it's a accredited through DIT it's, and it's European accredited. But, but we've got a feeling that some of the people do the course and then get go back into the practices and get polled to look after the diabetes patients, to look after the blood pressure monitoring, to look after the vaccination, to look after everything else. So it's an issue. And in the, in the COPD program, we may have to look at something else. But of course, in the current climate, we went for the most cost-effective, cheapest option that was available. But I think some sort of outreach uh, spirometry from hospitals is what we're probably going to have to do. And we know, was, uh, I think it was Dr. Uh, Deputy Doherty who mentioned experience from other countries. We know in Scotland that this is how they're getting spirometry done there, is by getting outreach. And it's been done in Denmark and in Holland as well to do outreach uh, for certain things. But of course, it costs money. Um, the, 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 the interesting thing uh, that Deputy Byrne mentioned about uh, housing, and it's just again anecdotally, but uh, I've uh, been looking at disability stickers, uh, with disability stickers for patients who've got bad COPD, can't park and so on, and the uh, Dunleary Council uh, were not giving them on the basis of lung disease for a long time, so you have to sort of write letters and put in a degree of hassle, whereas if you put down cardiac disease, they automatically got it. So that's the sort of thing we're facing with, in terms of respiratory, that's not just in most of those patients looking for disability stickers but obviously we see OPD patients, but respiratory disease in general suffers from that lack of problem. Has that mindset changed, do you think, sufficiently? I think the recognition, we, I mean, it, this is an issue why we need a specific support group. Uh, to, to do that sort of thing. If you find an issue, if maybe Dunleary, I think I probably battered them down on Dunleary at this stage, but you know, what's happening around the country? You know, if you're in Limerick or Galway and you're looking for a disability sticker, do you, does the local council person who gets all these requests, I mean, some of the requests that we would get, and, the, and you know from being public representatives, some of the requests you get are just not sustainable. Uh, but, you know, when you get somebody who got genuinely uh, marked disability from uh, COPD and they're not getting a sticker, I'm sure a lot of hard pressed doctors and healthcare providers would just say, cardiac, go and get it. I'll put it on the letter. I, that might be helpful. But, you know, the, the CFD support group, which hopefully we have up and running, okay. will we'll address that. I think. Okay. Thank you. And Mr. Watt. Thanks, Kieran. Um, just to answer some of the questions in relation to cystic fibrosis, um, uh, Professor Crown uh, raised the issue about access to beds and vents before Christmas there, which our association uh, raised in the public media. Well, it, it just reflect it's a good example of how effective the work of this committee can be, because I think calling the management of St. Uh, Vincent's in to account for their um, actions around that was very, very helpful. And I'm glad to say that um, since the issue was raised by our association and by the committee here, that there has been no problems in Vincent's and uh, people have been accessing the beds. And as to acknowledge Dr. McCone here, who's played a very important role from a clinician's point of view, ensuring that's happened. But we'll, we'll, not, we'll monitor things very closely and we're not complacent about the issue at all. In, in relation to, to Deputy Doherty's question about um, uh, the um, Bowman inpatient beds, we're glad to say that Liam Duffy has agreed and Vince and Bowman has agreed to put the number of beds into the service plan for the hospital, the development plan for the hospital. But we very much welcome some sort of letter from this committee um, to the RDO and the hospital saying that this is a priority. So if, if that could be done, that would, would be very, very helpful in terms of trying to get some momentum to that and, and acknowledge um, uh, Dr. Jerry McIlvany here, who's, who's played a leading role in pushing this issue as well. He's a CF consultant in Bowman, but it's, um, that would be very helpful in, in pushing that. Uh, in relation to um, health promotion and donor awareness, I think Deputy Burr makes a really important point. Um, donor awareness is left to the NGOs, the Irish Kidney Associations ourselves. There's virtually no support from the HSE. In England, you see ads on television, including, you know, encouraging organ donor awareness. There's a national register where you can donate your organs online. None of that exists in Ireland. It's a disgrace, to be honest. Um, it's not as we priority. We hope it's part of a work programme to look at that later in the in, in the, the summertime. A brilliant one. We'll come back to you. Maybe we're in a different hat on that. Um, uh, but also um, to say, um, too, that in terms of love your lungs as well, I mean, I think the point that you, um, um, uh, Deputy uh, Colreavy and Deputy Doherty have made um, in, in terms of, of not seeing that programme, it's because it's left to ourselves. We have no money. You know, we're trying to do things in Buzzwells. 
Um, there, there, there are virtually no interest from the HSC and the Department of Health, never mind public support. I oh, mean, there's no in the HSC, the Department of Health. Say again? Oh, you mean there's no interest? There's no, I mean, it's been raised with them and, um, you know, uh, we're saying we're doing this. Um, will you like to come on board? Will you, up, will you put it on your website? Would you give it, even give us some minimal resources for this? And there's not even a, you know, basic interest around it, you know, in terms of, it's something, we're doing the job, basically, of the HSE. I mean, it's completely and utterly unacceptable, you know, their approach. And, you know, we really ask for this committee support to the the HSE and the uh, Department of Health, they would give substantial support for this programme over the next while, even if we do all the work, if they at least support it, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a, a no-brainer, but, but I think it's the bottom line, I think it's, it should be expected, you know, so, so those, those are the issues, I would say. Okay. Sorry. Mr. Connor might be able to answer this as well. Who in the department, who is the clinical lead in the department for lung, in the HSE okay. for lung-related issues? And I'll bring in Deputy Colreavy now to say as well. Uh, just two issues, and, and it, it, it's not questions for, 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 for the, the people here today. I think I always understood that one of the, the foundation principles of the, the HSE, an underlying principle, is that access to health care is based on, on medical need and it's not based on ability to pay or it's not based on, 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 on geographic location. Now we learn that access to health care is based on need geographic location and hospital pharmacy budget. That wouldn't entirely be correct, not to be fair. I think we need urgent clarification from the department. That would be a misrepresentation, now, to be fair, of the, of, the, of the policy of the HSC, to be fair to the HSC, when I hear the defendants as today, but that wouldn't be exactly fair. If we had, ev we have evidence here today that depending on a hospital's pharmacy budget, required med medication is or is not been made available. Well, what, 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 what we need clarification. What, what, what I was going to suggest in my closing remarks is that we would, as a committee, take this issue up with the HSC, and we can place it on the agenda. Uh, Deputy McClellan or any other member, if it's from your party, can have a question to the HSC as part of the quarterly meeting on this particular issue. I also think that the, the point that Mr. Mr. Watt made needs to be addressed and addressed seriously, because it's wrong that people who are effectively doing the work of the HSE, do not have the active, active support of the HSE in doing that work. Can I just ask that question, what is it the HSE not doing for you? In, well, in, in, in the kinds of your remarks, if I, please, yeah. just to flesh it out. I just want to make a, a comment really, because I think this gives you a sense of the challenges that we're facing. Um, we've presented to you the data, the importance of lung disease, and I, I think that has been communicated very well. The HSE have a health promotion strategy document that's recently been published. It talks about the crises, the, 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 the public health challenges that are, that are being faced by uh, the uh, Irish government, and there is no mention of lung disease in it. They talk about coronary artery disease, diabetes, obesity, a variety, and, and they talk about smoking, of course, and I think that that's what we're trying to get across here, is that smoking will impact respiratory disease, but that there's a substantial morbidity that is not related to smoking. So we do need advocates. We need advocates to go to the HSE and say, where is respiratory disease when you're making these policy documents? Focus on it, have an independent approach to it, so that we can work on trying to improve outcomes for this huge patient population. I mean, one in five is the numbers we've been hearing repeatedly here. And we need to really advocate to try and get the HSE to recognise that and to work with us to try and develop a, a strategic uh, a, a document to move forward. Okay. Mr. McLean, do you want to get it? Well, I, I just, uh, what I'd like to lobby for uh, would be a lot more awareness of, of the COPD. Because as, as we discovered, awareness is the key to, to getting, you know, to get, to get the word out there. And, and like you could go on the street now and you could ask, I'd say, 10 people and you'd find that there might be two might have heard of it, so awareness. And also on the, um, it was brought up here by Professor McDonald here, the outreach. Um, we don't have outreach in Sligo, but it's, it's, it's rolled out in uh, 12 hospitals around the country. And I know from from my experience of, of meeting people who are involved in a re an outreach program that it does work. And I mean, who better to know? Like, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a patient myself, and rather than be in hospital for 10 days 
you'd be quite happy to be at home because you're, you're in your own environment and less chance of picking up hospital um, bugs and so on like that. So I, I would push for, for that and help with uh, more uh, pulmonary rehabs around the country because there's they're only spotted here and there and I mean I have gone through four of them now and they definitely work. Okay, thank you. Any other person want to make a contribution or President Adam? Just uh, I think there was a question about what the HSE is doing in terms of uh, respiratory. It's got a number of programs in the clinical program uh, devoted to respiratory. There are three. There's one in COPD, there's one in asthma, and there's one in cystic fibrosis. But that's three. Uh, there's gaps there, as we've heard today, for other areas. We haven't heard about the issues that related to uh, sleep. We haven't heard about anything related to interstitial lung disease. There's nobody here today for representing those. There's nobody here today representing uh, tuberculosis, which is another area. And again, going back to Deputy Colreevy's issue, again, at a disease of deprivation that perhaps hasn't had the attention it, uh, it merits. OK. Can I thank everybody for coming in? And thank you for your presentation. I think it was a very interesting, worthwhile, challenging part of our process of meetings uh, as a committee uh, and as a very clear message has emerged from our meeting today, not least the, the, fact, the fact that we have to have a clear strategy and a joint approach to the Department of Health and the HSC and also that we must, we must tackle uh, the stigma that it's the disease of the deprived of the poor, that's certainly a message and also that there is a need uh, to, to, as members have alluded, to change the mindset that it's that respiratory disease or lung disease it, or illness is because of smoking. It's an awful lot more than that, and we need to really change that message. But can I again thank, sorry, Deputy. Sorry to interrupt, and I, just, okay. I don't want to assume, just in case we leave here and I'm making a wrong assumption, are we agreed that we're going to send a letter to the I, I'm going to make that next point that you made. Right. And also, can you include the RDO then of the uh, Dublin North East or DE uh, with regard to Bowman Hospital and the 13 beds? Cause um, and my final comment was that we would, if, if, if the meeting would agree, that we will take a number of issues in terms of the uh, sleep apnea with the HSE, uh, that we will also write to the HSE in the proposal that you just made there uh, in terms of the medication, yeah. and that we will communicate with the department and the HSE in that, and thirdly, that we will talk right to the RDO of the North East regarding the beds in Beaumont. Yeah. Is that agreed? Agreed. Okay. Any other business? Well, I'm just, can I also, my, my apology again, thank you for this morning as part of our process and just to commend Senator Buck, uh, who is suffering from sleep deprivation this morning. Uh, That's right. Um, from, from, from being Same problem as junior doctors have, you know. Uh, um, thank you. Very, very quick straw poll of our guests. Would you in general be in favour of the idea that the national parliament's precincts should be oh, that, inside that's, and outside that's, that's the smoke free zone? That's not a question I'm going to allow, allow you to even attempt it. Would anybody like to say no? Not, 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 least, no. Because, not least because of a number of members. Not, not least, Senator Crom, that because a number of members of the committee might feel free to interject. But can I just, can I just very sincerely, um, on a very positive note, um, thank everybody for coming in this morning and for your presentations. I think, as I said, it would be, be part of a process that we'll engage in. Um, Senator Crone has been very active in promoting a different strategy about uh, how we see life, and um, that's challenging members of the committee. We're adjourned. Um, just remind members, sorry, before we adjourn, that next Thursday morning at half past nine, uh, Operation Transformation personnel will be in the uh, presentation, make a presentation to the committee as part of their television program. Um, so members and that, Senator Burke. Junior doctor issue as I raised it. We have a correspondence which was too late for today's meeting, right. um, which will be discussed um, as part of a strategy to have a hearings on the issue of the NCHD, hopefully before the end of May, if not sooner. It's a question of fitting, finding time in our calendar to do that. But I thought we agreed that we would have it on a Tuesday in particular. We're, we're hoping to do that. We have a number of imminent bills coming to us, um, yes. but it's a question of getting together. And, and if you want to talk to the clerk afterwards, in terms of we had correspondence from uh, Shirley Coulter, who's the Assistant Director of Industrial Relations um, for the Irish Medical Organisation, which was too late for the meetings this morning. In the car it will be on the correspondence for next Thursday, and we hope to put in place a strategy to work on this. And if you have any suggestions between the meetings, you can talk to the clerk. I'll do that. Thanks, Trevor. All right. So we stand adjourned until half nine next Thursday morning. Good morning.